Good evening and welcome to the first cabinet meeting of 2024. Uh, my name is Stephen Cowan. I'm the leader of the London Borough of Hammersmith and Fulham. And welcome uh, to the meeting. Um, a few housekeeping points. If the fire alarm goes, I can see there's a member of public here, then uh, please follow the directions out of the door and down the uh, emergency staircases, which are immediately to your left as you go through the door. Uh, and you will be directed to an assembly point. Um, okay, what we will do is go around the room and confirm the members of the cabinet who are in attendance. So can I start on my left, please? And if you could call you, uh, introduce yourself, uh, I would yeah. be extremely grateful. Okay. Over to you, Andrew. Uh, good evening, I'm Andrew Jones. I'm the cabinet member for the economy. Good evening, everybody. I'm Wesley Harcourt, cabinet member for climate change and ecology. Good evening, I'm um, Sharon Holder, Cabinet Member for Public Realm. Hello, I'm Ben Coleman, I'm the Deputy Leader and Cabinet Member for Health and Adult Social Care. Good evening, thank you. Good evening, Francis Ume, Cabinet Member for Housing and Homelessness. Good evening, Rowan Ree, Cabinet Member for Finance and Reform. Hello, I'm Alex Sanderson and I'm the Cabinet Member for Children and Education. So it's Alex breaking the ranks uh, with a hello instead of a good evening. And uh, we have uh, Cathy Neal, uh, Grant Degg and Sharon Lee, who are respectively the committee coordinator, the assistant director of legal and the chief executive, all in attendance. So thank you very much for that. We're going to crack on now with... Sorry, it's it's just not because perhaps we interview some people who've got the legal responsibility to carry up the cabinet meeting. I'm happy to welcome you, Councillor Alford, and to indeed mention you and again wish you Happy New Year. <laughs> okay, all right, uh, moving on then, um, we'll move to the minutes. Have you, you've all perused those over the Christmas break. Um, are there any points arising from the minutes? Are they agreed? Agreed. Excellent. Uh, apologies for absence. Uh, I've had two come in, uh, which is from Councillor Kwon, uh, who's ill, and Councillor uh, Harvey. Um, are there any more apologies? Thank you very much. They are recorded. And are there any declarations of interest? No. Uh, well, in that case, I hand on to item four, where we're very fortunate to have Denise Fox, chair of the London Borough of Hammersmith and Fulham's Teaching Commission and the retired head of Fulham Cross Girls School. And Denise is going to speak about this report uh, before inviting Councillor Sanderson. So can I begin before we do that to say, look, we recognise that commissions are a... Um, uh, please be seated, uh, Denise. Look, the council recognises that these commissions are a hugely important way that we make public policy in in public with, with and often with the public, and uh, they take a, a, a tremendous amount of volunteer work, and we are profoundly grateful for your chairing and for your the many hours and the and the fine report that you've put in. But without predicating that, uh, please uh, allow you you know please take us to your introduction. Thank you. Um, it seems a long time ago now. Um, so what I thought I'd do this evening, because you've all obviously all got the report and you're all capable of uh, reading it and seeing the recommendations, is just really take you through the process um, that we went through for the Teaching Commission to actually get to, to the final um, report. And I think it was sometime in the summer of 2019 that Councillor Larry Colhane approached me to um, lead the Teaching Commission. I think one of the reasons that we were looking, um, he was looking at was the um, Borough Manifesto for 218 and 20 to 22, and particularly looking at teacher retention in Hammersmith and Fulham. 
Myself, I'm a Hammersmith and Fulham resident, went to school in Hammersmith and Fulham, grew up in Hammersmith and Fulham, still live in Hammersmith and Fulham, and have uh, taught at Hurlingham School when it was Hurlingham, not Hurlingham and Chelsea. And then I was at Fulham Cross. So I did 42 years in total in Hammersmith and oh. Fulham. So, and then was obviously head at Fulham Cross, uh, where we had a very stable staff um, and were getting very, very good results. Um, at the school, obviously, because we had uh, very good teachers that we were able to 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 keep. So we had the um, the setup of the commission, and we had um, several academic members, which whose names are in the um, report for you to read, who were really researchers and professors and working in um, higher education. So they brought a lot of experience on the academic side. And then myself and Dave Collins, who's the executive principal of one of the primary schools in Hammersmith and Fulham, and Claire Wagner, who actually left the borough, were the three main teachers that were on the on the commission. Um, we produced the terms of reference, looking at the manifesto, as I said, and obviously what was going on nationally at that time with teacher retention and recruitment. Um, and basically came through to two strands. There was an academic strand of looking at all the data and all the research. And then there was a more practical strand of looking at what the teachers and the support staff, because we included all the staff, not just teaching staff, what they thought um, they wanted from working in Hammersmith and Fulham. Um, so we set up um, a work plan to map out the progress over the, the time that we had allocated. And we produced several lines of inquiry. And this was really um, developed by just really talking at the first meeting and looking at what research was out there, looking at teacher recruitment and retention, because the government at that time were doing quite a lot of work on flexible working, but it's quite difficult in teaching to actually have flexible working, although Fulham Cross did have um, quite a few members of staff who, who were part time. Um, we looked at the difference between the primary and the secondary sector in terms of teacher retention and recruitment. Um, we looked at uh, what the unions were saying, what teacher groups uh, were saying, parents, the teaching um, organisations um, that were around um, the governor's service. So we actually came up with quite a lot of literature um, to actually read and digest and look at. And then we came up with um, looking at what the teachers wanted. So we developed a survey which went out to all the staff um, in, I think it was um, 21, May, June 21, where the teachers filled in a questionnaire um, where they said why they wanted to work in the borough, what concerned them about working in the borough, why they were staying in the school, why they were thinking, thinking of leaving. Um, and then we came up with follow-up interviews. So I think in total, um, we had uh, something like, I'll find it now, um, parking, childcare, housing, health and wellbeing, job satisfaction, pay, which obviously the council can't do anything about, that's the, that's the government, um, and um, CPD and training. So up from actually seeing all of the staff, we had um, only 2% of nursery staff responded and 74% of primary staff, they were the largest, the primary school teachers, and then the secondary to school staff. And we had a lot more females respond rather than males, but then teaching is predominantly female. Um, I don't know what percentage is, but that was it. So we worked through those... Um, the evidence, the uh, academic people looked at the academic evidence and we were very lucky that one of the people on the, on, the, on the commission was actually a researcher. So she was able to drill down and look at all the lines of inquiry. And then uh, Mr. Collins and I um, developed the survey. And then after we administered the survey, we then looked at the results. And then I'd, uh, we had asked in the survey if uh, people were willing to have follow-up interviews. Um, I, re I retired in that summer, and so I carried on um, and was able to go out and interview the staff that had said they were willing to be involved. Um, and then come up, I think, from October um, to the November, 
we actually managed to gather all the evidence and bring it back to, to the committee meeting. And then we began to uh, bring together the report. Um, we finalised the report in November, December um, and of 21. And then I think it was finally written um, in February um, 22. And the main points that were coming out of it were teaching and training and um, staff development, um, health, health and well-being, again, mental health, which has grown quite a lot. And obviously from COVID was a, a big factor. Flexible working, housing, childcare and parking. So they were the um, sort of six main themes that came through from the staff. And so that is how the report really got pulled together and is coming to you um, with the recommendations that obviously you'll be able to follow through, hopefully, and let the staff know. Can I just also I'd like to say a massive thanks to Hannah Parrott, who's still working in Hammersmith and Fulham, although she's moved on, who was absolutely brilliant, and Lorraine Mitchell, both who I know has since moved on. Um, they were both very supportive and really, really brilliant. They helped a great deal um, to keep everything flowing and kept all the paperwork in order and everything. So personal thanks from me to, to them and to the members of the commission. So I don't know if anyone's got any questions they'd like to ask me. Well, I know uh, the cabinet member will want to uh, give a statement, so I will move uh, swiftly on to Councillor Sanderson, uh, who will uh, come in after that. But thank you for your uh, very erudite and interesting uh, explanation. Denise, much appreciated. Uh, Councillor Sanderson. Thank you very much, Leader. And really, it's just to say thank you so much, Denise, to you and all of the commissioners. We all know that a really good teacher can stay with you for your, the whole of your life and how important schools and teachers are in improving children's life outcomes and chances for the rest of their lives. And that whilst times are tough for schools, it's so important that we do more than we, we have done ever to support our school community. Um, obviously, this commission has been a few years in the making, but despite that delay, we have started to implement some of the recommendations that are in the report. And we look forward to taking time to consider the rest and we'll feed back to you on those. But thank you again to you and every single one of the commissioners for all of your expertise, passion and time that's gone into the commission. Um, so, yeah, really, thank you from all of us. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. Right. Now I throw it open to questions. Um, so um, who on, in, in the cabinet would like to ask a question of Denise? or indeed in the opposition. <laughs> no? You've made, um, you made a number of recommendations in a number of areas, and the, the analysis underpinning them was interesting, and the comments about the borough, it's, uh, it, it's, it's challenging. And do you prioritise the areas according to what you think is most important for teachers and so on? But of all the recommendations, if there was one thing, if you imagine you're in a pub with us at the moment, you're know, having a chat. <laughs> If there was one thing you think that we could really do to make a difference to address the issues you've addressed, what would it be? Well, I think, first of all, the main thing is the schools are very, very different. And obviously, I think the ethos and the culture of the school is important. I mean, I was very lucky when I was at Fulham Cross. We had a very, very stable staff, a very happy staff. And so we did do a lot of training, a lot of personal development. And I think we treated people like human beings. Um, sometimes that's overlooked a little bit in times of, of, tr of trouble. Um, I think the three things that came out very much from um, some of the personal interviews that I found quite enlightening. Parking was a real big thing for, and I know we're an eco bar and all the rest of it, but it was a real big thing, especially for the primary school teachers who some of the primary schools don't have parking. At Fulham Cross, we did have parking and we used to let Sir John Lilly School park on, on our site because they didn't have parking and they were down the road. So, and I think in terms of stress, and if you're a young teacher, you've got a young family and you're, you know, running around trying to get to school in the traffic because you've got to get your car to get your kids at nursery and all the rest of it. Um, I think that was really, that was really, really important um, for a lot of people. I think for teachers, it's a split between their own professional development and developing themselves as good teachers because you never stop learning and teaching changes so very quickly. It's probably changed since, since I left. 
um, th I think that's that's really important that you've got that support in school to get that training, that personal development. So I think, you know, there's the external factors and there's the internal. So I think, you know, it, it's quite difficult to um, say one is more important than the other. Because for me personally, I live around the corner from Fulham Cross. I used to work to walk to school. Um, so that wasn't an issue issue for me personally. But if you're coming in from Surrey, obviously it is an issue, especially with things like the train strike and, you know, different things. So it just... I think it's really difficult to say one is more important than the other. Sorry to make it a bit more difficult for you, but you know, it it was That's very what, helpful. Thank it you. was what staff said. It was what, and it wasn't just the teachers; it was the support staff as well. Because I think sometimes we forget, you know, having really good uh, support staff is is important for teachers, you know, and, and teaching assistants. If you get really good teaching assistant who can support that child with special needs and you know what we want is for the children to have the best education they can get and best life chances so I think it, it's really important to support the teachers to allow them to do their job effectively great any more questions in that case I would say look to work 42 years in education in Miss Borough is heroic <laughs> um and then to come back for more to try and help other teachers <laughs> is um is double heroic so it. it was the best job in the world <laughs> best job in the world yeah i i think it is and to nurture young minds and send them on the way is fundamental to having the good society we strive for not just uh, uh, uh for the benefit of those children who are obviously a, a priority um so so um it's a topsy-turvy world that we're having to have a commission on how we hold on to teachers or indeed how we hold on to junior doctors or anybody else who mm. makes our world better um but this is a very fundamental it's a, a very solid piece of work uh it's very well researched i can tell you that already because some of the findings uh were coming out as we were um as you were working we've set about building homes for teachers mm. Um, and we see that as a critical thing because clearly driving and parking is one thing, but actually living in a decent place in a wonderful borough like this is a, is another. And um, so we are already adapting and adopting some of the um, some of the recommendations. Keep us houses and things. Yeah. Well, I'm against, we're against tied cottages, so we want to find a yeah. mechanism to give people housing security who work in those professions. That's great. Well, if there's nothing else, then all I can do is on behalf of the people of Hammersmith and Fulham to thank you for your work and to uh, to say that the officers will take this forward. Thank so you thank you very much. much. Thank you very much. And, and can, can you please pass on uh, all of our profound thanks to everyone who took part in the commission, everyone who gave evidence and everybody who uh, helped you uh, make it in such a robust uh, document. Thank you. Is that report noted? <laughs> and uh, okay, excellent. Um, that moves us then uh, uh, swiftly onto uh, as because I, I, I had a good teacher, so I can tell you five comes after four. Uh, and once again, we are with Councillor Alex Sanderson, who will talk us through um, the recommendation in the report. Thank you very much, Leader. The alternative provision strategy is part of a suite of documents which have been produced recently in regards to SEND and our alternative provision in LBHF. So it sets out our plan to ensure that alternative provision delivers the best possible outcome for our children and young people who are, for whatever reason, not able to be in school. Um, it's been guided by feedback from our key stakeholders, including young people and practitioners working across education, health and care services. <laughs> and highlights our priority areas around and including supporting young people at key points of transition, strengthens our outreach offer, whilst also providing a framework in which to hold the whole partnership accountable. Thank you. Uh, any questions to Councillor Sanderson? Any comments? In uh, which case, is that item agreed? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, in that case, I move on now to Councillor Ree. Uh, item number six, council tax support scheme. Uh, thank you very much, Leader. We're obviously very proud of our position on council tax in this borough. This administration has frozen or cut council tax five times in the last nine years, uh, meaning that we have 
uh, a low tax burden on residents um, and the third lowest council tax levels in the country. But we should also be very proud of our council tax support scheme, which is one of the country's most progressive. Uh, nearly half of residents receive a discount uh, through this scheme, uh, and we're one of only 34 councils uh, in England uh, who don't charge a penny to our most vulnerable residents. Uh, this is all the more important during a cost of living crisis. Uh, the council tax support scheme uh, continues the support for another year. Uh, there's also uh, an added element this year, which is uh, reaffirming uh, the disregards to war widows and war widowers. This uh, also exempts them uh, from council tax uh, and uh, entitles them to the same benefits as those who uh, joined the scheme after 2005. Great, just a clarification. So which groups are exempt? So war widows, um, do you want to run through some of the groups? Uh, exempt from council tax. Yep, uh, so um, care leavers are exempt. That was a decision that uh, we took uh, early on uh, as an administration. Uh, students are exempt uh, and uh, those on low incomes are exempt. Uh, there's also a bit more news to follow on this in the next item. Excellent. So um, any questions or comments? Councillor Alford. Just to say that I fully support about the war widows and widowers, that we should do our best and everything for them. Thank you very much, Councillor Alford. I, I, I would just stress that, you know, we should never forget that in 2010, our budget was £184 million. And the last year's budget was £132 million. If this was a business and we had dropped that income level, we would be probably in serious risk. Secondly, we've had a huge inflation and we've had hugely extra responsibilities. So to maintain a scheme like this, the most generous council tax support scheme in the country, to maintain that scheme in these particular circumstances, I don't just want to thank the finance team and Councillor Rowan Ree, I also want to thank all those officers who brought their budgets in uh, on uh, within within the envelope and are driving through a genuine efficiency program. It's those efficiencies, rooting out waste and putting money back into the pockets of the hardworking and, and often vulnerable families of the borough. That is what we went into politics for. So I can't thank enough everybody that's given us a very solid financial footing to do that. And to tell you the truth, giving, you know, exempting war widows, that's the right thing to do. I don't think any of us would ever know what it is like to go into action, risking your life to fight for our country. And often the effects on the family are extremely hard and traumatic. The fact that the efficiency we've driven allow us to make the right thing to do time after time is crucial to what the administration is about. So thank you very much to Rowan. Thank you to Sharon Lee, for making sure her team puts us in a position that we can make these choices. On that note then, is this item agreed? agreed. Thanks very much. We will move on to item number seven, council tax base and collection rate and back to Rowan Ree. Thank you very much, Leader. Uh, this report looks at the number of properties in the borough that are liable for council tax in the coming year. Uh, there are an extra 2,177 properties uh, that fall into um, this report this year, uh, and we're looking at a council tax collection rate of 97%. Uh, this also continues our policy of charging a premium uh, to those who leave homes empty at a time when so many people are struggling to get onto the housing ladder. There's also another important change in the scheme this year. Uh, this administration, as I mentioned earlier, took the decision to exempt care leavers from council tax. Today, I'm very happy to announce that in light of the uh, vital and important work that they do, foster carers uh, in the borough will now also be taken out of council tax. Any questions on that or comments? OK, I hear Ben saying it's good and he's quite right. Um, it, it is. Um, and again, I would stress, you know, we are surrounded in our borough by quiet heroes who go out and make our communities stronger. And the reason they do that is they give a little bit of themselves to others. There's no one more at the front of the queue of those quiet heroes than our foster carers. 
So our message to all foster carers is one of gratitude. And the fact that we can underline that by exempting them from council tax payment is something that I think is an extremely important measure. So thanks for doing that. I would say that you're quite right to also put a premium on to uh, empty properties. Empty properties are a blight on the community. Mm -hmm. If someone has a restaurant or a, uh, a shop, or indeed uh, you have schools that need filling, all of those things are predicated on the basis that we're building homes for people to live in. For people to own these homes and not live in them damages the community and people should rightly pay for that. So every opportunity we have to make that happen, I think we should take that forward. You know, there is nobody in any part of our society who's not affected by the housing crisis. And one thing we could do is to release those homes for people to live in. And I encourage anybody who's got an empty home to um, consider renting it immediately um, uh, or indeed selling it immediately. Okay, um, thank you very much for that. Is this item agreed? Right, next we have item number eight, and um, back with Councillor Ree. Thank you very much, I'm nearly done. Uh, so back to this year's um, budget. This is the Capital uh, Programme Monitoring Report for the second quarter. Um, the report asks Cabinet to note changes to the Capital Programme taking place uh, within the year. Any, any questions on that? Is that item agreed? Thanks very much. And still with you, Rowan, item number nine. Yes, last item from me. I'll uh, I'll stop talking in a moment. This is uh, the revenue uh, budget review um, as of month six, again, for uh, this year's budget. Um, we've currently identified pressures of uh, 5.1 million uh, and have put contingency measures in place of 4 million in order to rectify those. This council takes a ruthlessly financial efficient uh, approach to all, all budgets and will continue to monitor these to ensure value for money throughout the year. Great, any questions on that? I would just want to raise whether this is the appropriate item on the HRA or whether that's, as I think you all know, I have a passion for the HRA and I'm always worrying about it. Now I have, and I will pay tribute to the, the officers, I have been having some very good, clear, concise briefings on the state of the HRA, but I'd just like some reassurance from you that we're not going to be you lose too much, too much of our reserves. I know that they have been doing a stellar job trying to claw back, but I would still like a bit more reassurance. Of course, uh, and thank you for asking that question, Councillor Alford. Uh, Councillor uh, uh, Ree, Ume, which of you would like to answer? Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, I, I think you're right to raise it. It's an issue that um, you know, we're, we're uh, keeping an eye, a firm eye on. But I think it's probably worth going back to the, the point of having reserves. As, as you'll know, it's, it's there for planned future expenditure to try and uh, to smooth this out over multiple years. Um, but also as a sort of a rainy day fund when things go wrong. I think we'd all acknowledge that there's um, we, we've had a bit of a rainy day when it comes to uh, the housing department and we're spending money now to make sure that the homes that residents live in are uh, as good as they can possibly be. Um, that takes money and so we're, we're spending it. We have set a, um, a floor for how much money can be taken out of uh, HRA reserves. Uh, we're sticking to that rigidly. Uh, and we are not uh, in any way going to put the HRA at risk. Well, I want the reassurance on that we've got a, a, you know, a set level that we will not drop below because, as we all know, we've had a lot of rainy days, and it only needs one, God forbid, something to happen, and then we will be in a mess. And I don't want that for us. And I want to be sure that we will not hope again anything happens. But you know what I mean? We've got that money aside that we can if it all goes pear shaped that we're not going to have used all our reserves yeah absolutely my, my, myself and councillor may are keeping a, a very close eye on the hra reserves and uh, have a plan to start replenishing those uh, uh, in the coming uh, financial years but yeah i, I think that's that's that, that's it's an excellent question uh councillor alford i would just say look any long-term financial management involving hundreds of millions of pounds uh is always going to be a 
complicated matter and always therefore has to be seen in the long term. I would say over the last 15, 20 years, the HRA has been through ups and downs. The critical point, I would say, uh, there were two things. There was a strategic change made by George Osborne to uh, council's ability to raise funds through rents and other measures, and the long-term depletion of HRAs, not just here in Amazon Fulham, but across the United Kingdom began then. And I think you see that playing out across the country with all sorts of problems on planned maintenance budgets. And that, that's gone on. I think the second thing, which, if, if, you know, if we're to look back on the last 10, 15 years, the thing that most saved the HRA was cancelling the West Ken and Gibbs Green estates being sold. Um, and I don't think this should ever be lost from the history books. But what, 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 Putting aside the moral rights and wrongs of selling the West Cape and Gibbs Green estates and just looking at the sale of those estates, what the estates involved was the sale involved a commitment by the London Borough Hammersmith and Fulham to take on capital and county PLC's obligation for us to buy out freeholders and leaseholders. And the money set aside for that was from the sale of the estates. And that wasn't index linked. So that was linked to whatever it, the price was at 2012 or 13. So what would have happened if that scheme had gone ahead is we would have started, there was 11% affordable housing on it. There was an awful lot of people who needed rehousing and there was an awful lot of people who needed buying out, about 40% needed buying out the leaseholder and freeholder properties. That 104 million pounds was never enough to do it. And because it wasn't index linked, it wouldn't have kept up, kept up with inflation. And that would have bankrupted the HRA pretty much within this decade. Uh, and there would be nothing any future administration could have done to save it. So whilst I recognise it's always worth uh, looking at the numbers as they go up and down and fluctuate, I think as we advise future administrations, you know, history always does that. And we should never do a scheme like that again, which would have bankrupted the HRA. You know, and that's something just that should be noted historically, I think, because it's a learning point for everybody, particularly those involved at the time. Um, but you're very wise to raise this. And I'm very pleased that we've got uh, uh, Councillor Re and Councillor Ume on that matter. If I could just add one final sort of comment, it's to do with the HRA, is, and I appreciate again, that we are having a lot of extra expense, and forgive me, I'm going to use a very unpleasant word, with the ambulance chasers, as I call them, the lawyers that are chasing the compensation. I am always deeply concerned by their profiteering. And I don't suppose you expected to hear that from a Tory. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing what you hear these days, <laughs> but I can completely agree. Uh, well, I believe we fundamentally have to care, and I believe in our residents and compensating them. I hope we're being as rigorous as we can be with the people who are profiteering. We have no time for profiteers. Uh, we do have time for our residents and um, balancing that compassionate approach with a rigorous uh, kick-ass approach uh, with those who try to take advantage is um, our day-to-day -day meat and potatoes, if that's not a colorful mix of metaphors. So, but you're right. Thank you very much for that comment. Is there anything else anyone would like to ask? Nope. In which case, is that item agreed? Thanks very much. We then move on to emergency planning and business continuity support. Uh, Rebecca Harvey isn't here. So I will just uh, run through. Um, everyone, I think, knows that the council has responsibilities under the Civil Contingencies Act 2004 to plan and respond to emergencies and to have business continuity arrangements in place to reduce the risk of service disruption. I can tell you, having been the first council in Britain to declare an emergency during the pandemic, that um, those contingencies need continuously updating. Things like, what do we do if there's an infectious disease with keeping our parks open? What do we do about care homes? You remember we closed ours and therefore saved thousands of lives. What do we do about public messaging, particularly public messaging that might be different to the governments as we did our public messaging, telling people to wear a mask, for example, in May with banners from our lampposts was the government didn't get onto that until the autumn of 2020. These were the measures that we took 
then, and therefore uh, we've rightly reviewed the Civic Contingencies Act as someone who had uh, daily meetings, sometimes two, three uh, meetings a day to discuss the issues coming up under the last civic emergency. I think that the next one uh, will require a similar agility. And we've tried to capture that in this report and in doing so, put any future administration on the right footing uh, should a civic emergency happen. All, all I would say, and it's very sobering, you know, the last pandemic, when we had the pandemic, you know, um, it was almost like, how do you tell a public that where life is about to enter a really bad B movie? And 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 to and to be like nothing they'd known before in the whole of the post-war period of society. In fact, nothing I think any of us have ever really known before. And there are huge lessons to be learned. And I do think that what we need to do is to have a, a rigorous national debate of what that might be for one very simple reason. Every simple piece of advice I've had on infectious diseases is we got off lightly with the last pandemic. Um, the, people had been expecting something much, much worse. And there is every chance that that could happen in the future. So I never thought I would be in politics and be warning that these things really matter. They were only ever paperwork previously. But I can tell you these things are crucial and deserve serious study. So if there are any questions on it, I would be happy to take them. I think, Councillor Alford, no? Okay. I like agreeing with you, but you are absolutely right. We did, though people will be horrified by my saying we got off lightly. It could have been considerably worse. And I think a lot of people have never understood that. Okay. Um, I, I say got off lightly in the sense that it was, the you know, as diseases go, it was an easier disease to catch than some of the things they've been modelling. Um, um, but there are other risks, uh, not least the fact, um, um, uh, and this report tries to capture that. Okay. Uh, can we have this report agreed? Thanks very much. And then we have item number 11, again, in uh, the name of Councillor Harvey, but I understand we have Matt uh, here to uh, run through that report. So do you want to come and take your seat, Matt? Hi, do you want to introduce the report? Yes. Uh Evening, everyone. Um, so this is the report to um, Cabinet to agree the Council's uh, strategy to tackle serious violence. Uh, we've been under a duty to um, produce this strategy uh, and the deadline for publication is the end of this month. We've spent the previous year um, working closely with the duty holders, as outlined in the report, working with the voluntary and community sector and specifically consulting uh, young people to find out what their concerns are about serious violence in the borough. We produced uh, a needs assessment, which really carefully looked at all the different data sets from the police and from the health agencies. Uh, and that is what the recommendations are, are, are based on in the strategic document that is in front of you this evening. Uh, the deadline for publication is the end of this month to, um, to fit with the legislation. It certainly is. All right, thank you. Are there any questions to uh, to, to, to Matt or, or, or on this report? In that case, is it agreed? Thanks very much. Uh, thank, um, right, we then move swiftly on to uh, um, item number 12, and that's in the name of uh, Councillor Ume. Thanks very much, Leader. So, as the cost of living crisis continues to take its toll and there's an increase in Section 21 no-fault evictions, as well as a rise in the number of people who are sleeping rough, it is vital that this property at Liddy Road uh, continues to provide a place for residents to call home. So <clears throat> this report is seeking Cabinet's approval to purchase the Liddy, Liddy Road rough sleepers accommodation from the registered provider home group. Uh, it's a hostel that's formed part of the council's commissioned single homeless and rough sleeping pathway for many years and provides 13 different bed spaces. It's currently managed by St. Mungo's and uh, the sale itself will pose a risk to residents, their well-being and the future resilience of this supported pathway. 
So this report also follows a robust options appraisal and it's considered the best option to purchase this property in the current circumstances. Thank you very much. Any questions to Councillor May? Yep. Ooh, uh, I thought you were, I thought oppositions are allowed. Yeah, no, we're happy to show you the financials. I think, but it's two things. Firstly, thank you for attending Cabinet. You will remember for most of our 10, nearly 10 years in office, we didn't have any opposition attending Cabinet. So whilst it's a recent thing that you attend it, and a welcome thing, it wasn't the norm. Um, there are legal processes to allow you to see notes if we have notice you're attending uh, the Cabinet. And uh, I'm absolutely uh, certain that we will make those available to you. And uh, indeed, we will, uh, if you'd like to ask questions after we can have an exempt moment in the cabinet. Yes, well, I will, therefore, at your leisure, we will allow you to see the uh, uh, relevant financials uh, from an exempt agenda. I, I will uh, ask a council, I will ask uh, Katia Neal to coordinate with that with you on that. I don't have any problems with this. It's just the, the, the principle of not knowing certain financials. That's right. Okay. Well, I, like I said, if, uh, my offer to you is if you want to cover that, in the, we can have an exempt part of this meeting. If not, uh, then we'll send it to you at your leisure. We'll discuss that with you at your leisure. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. In which case, is that item agreed? Thanks very much. And thank you, Councillor Alford. Um, can we move on then to um, item number 14, which is to, um, sorry, item number 13, which is Councillor Andrew Jones, Cabinet of the Economy, Acquisition of Affordable Homes on Quayside Lodge. Uh, thank you. Yes, this is a, a report with some very good news. Broadly speaking, this is uh, a, an opportunity that has arisen to purchase 37 affordable homes uh, in a development that is under construction and more constructed than not that would have been with uh, a registered social landlord. Uh, this will enable us to purchase the, the homes as affordable homes for the council and will also allow us to make them probably more affordable in the tenure. Um, the 37 units, the other important thing to note in the report uh, is that we have a, a strategy around family accommodation and there are more larger units in these uh, amongst this tenure mix than we have had in some developments, two and three bed particularly. So that's also advantageous. Uh, as the report sets out, obviously there's an exempt part to uh, the comment before, but it is uh, financially advantageous, um, commercially advantageous I think is the phrase used in the report. Uh, and there, therefore I strongly endorse this as increasing um, in a, in a non-planned way in the sense that this opportunity we didn't know we had 12 months ago. Uh, the other final thing to the earlier discussion is that there is a positive impact on the HRA position over the long term as a consequence of doing this, uh, some of which is contained within the exempt report, which you can see later. Excellent. Any questions to Councillor Jones? Yep. <laughs> Okay. What is, what is the time scale of actually acquiring these properties? And if I've missed it, I apologise. As the report sets out, I think we're in the negotiation now. If this is for approval of heads of terms, so that the agreement is in place, it's relatively soon. Um, I'm looking at Grant, but I think I think given the nature, the the development has more or less built. So there's a possibility of having these homes by May or June this year available. So it's very soon. It's very positive. If there's no more questions, uh, I will move to uh, ask the cabinet is that agreed? Thank you very much. And then uh, the next item is with Councillor Coleman on the award of home care and independent living service contracts. Uh, Councillor Coleman. Thank you. Yes, as you know, we are the only council in the country to have taken the decision to abolish charges for care for disabled and older people at home. Uh, and we've done we did that in 2015 and it's it's been widely welcomed what we're determined to do now is not just make this the best borough in terms of cost for people who are elderly and disabled who need care at homes but also the best borough in terms of quality 
because the fact that you're not paying for care doesn't necessarily mean you're getting the highest quality care. That can be the case on occasion. It's not the case all the time. And just as our manifesto in 2014 guaranteed to abolish the charges, so our manifesto at the last election said that we would have carers for our residents who are consistent and well-trained and regular and punctual and knowledgeable about individual residents' needs. And I know this is an issue across London, but we want to be the best in everywhere we can. So as part of delivering that, we thought it would be helpful to take a new approach to the way in which we provide care. So rather than have care provided by three providers in three parts of the borough, we divide the borough into 12 patches, so have 12 contracts, which enables us to cover the risk issues more effectively and also competition issues. So if somebody's not performing well, it's easier to bring another provider in to ensure that they do. And this is going to come, if you want, hand in hand with a whole range of other measures to ensure 100% perfection, which is our small ambition here. Uh, and that's what this paper sets out. It sets out the award of the contracts. And I should also note, if I may, that obviously we will continue to pay the London living wage to all the carers as we do to all our contractors and subcontractors. And we will also be paying travel time between visits, which again is not something that every council has been able to do. Thank you. Any questions on that? Nope. Okay. Um, is that agreed? Thank you very much. Uh, we move on then to the forward plan. Is that noted? Yes. In which case, that brings the meeting to an end. Can I uh, end as this is New Year by wishing everyone who's tuned in a happy 2024 and hope that this is a year where we see some genuine significant improvements and changes in our borough and indeed our wonderful country. Thank you.